options, and we are going to be looking at a magnificent passage there, very, very practical passage there in Colossians chapter 3. I didn't plan it this way. Uh, It wasn't some kind of master plan of mine, sort of providentially fell to us this way, but what better Sunday than the Sunday we first gather all together in one service than to study the subject of biblical relationships. Today of all days, we're talking about how the Bible pictures our relationship with one another. How do we treat one another inside the church? What a grace of God that He's given us to study this. I pray it'll be a blessing to you. If you're new with us, we have been discussing our ministry philosophy, why we do what we do and how we do it. It's anchored in the sufficiency of the Word. The church is the pillar and buttress of truth. We are here because of the Word. We are saved because of the Word. We're sanctified by the Word. The Spirit applies God's Word to our hearts. It explains to us how we are to live, and therefore it's the foundation of the church, it says in Ephesians chapter 4. Our church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, specifically what they have said in Scripture. And of course, we go to Scripture to find out about biblical relationships. How do we relate with one another inside a local church? Let me read to you Colossians chapter 3, and I'll begin in verse 12 and go down to verse 17. That's our text for today. Just follow along as I read aloud. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were indeed called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I pray the Lord blesses the reading of His word. What kind of things do you think God says should define us? As as church people, and I know not everyone here is a church person. Maybe this is your first time to church. Maybe you've just been to church a few times. Maybe it's your first time here. But what should define a church? What should be definitively true about a congregation of people? Well, the Bible points us in a couple of directions. One is in terms of method and format and structure, order, right? Who are the leaders? Who makes decisions? Who's, who's qualified to serve? Who's, who's qualified to lead? Who's qualified to teach and preach? This is, of course, something that we see all over Scripture. As you read the New Testament, the Bible gives us plenty of information on, on how we are to organize ourselves and, and what we are to do and how we, how we operate However, there is, even though those things are very vital, there is something that I believe the Scripture places on a higher plane of importance. And I know people don't really care about how the Bible tells us to be organized, and we try to pay a lot of attention to that. There is something that I believe the Bible, just by volume of what it says, puts on a higher plane in terms of how we relate to one another. The Scripture clearly teaches us all throughout particularly the New Testament, speaking to churches, the most important thing in relationship with one another is our character, our attitudes, our demeanor, the love that we should have for one another inside the body of Christ. These character character traits are definitive of the church, even, even before the church began to be organized. If you look at Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, you see that this, that this church is operating in such a way that it's demonstrating their love to one another. They're, they're sacrificing for one another. And though Scripture would indicate that there should be some kind of order, some kind of structure, some type of, uh, of way that we should operate, the most important thing, as you read Scripture, is our character, is our 
attitudes to one another. Again, that's not to say that organizations shouldn't be biblical or that we should cast it aside. I mean, we live in, again, we live in a day where people don't care what the Bible says about organization. We should do it as biblically as we can. But just based on the volume of Scripture, our attitudes and actions toward one another are the most important thing. Jesus, even though he gave some basic notions on church structure, his, his focus from the very beginning is how we forgive one another, how we act to one another, how we correct one another and disciple one another. Of course, no one displays the character that we should have toward one another more than Jesus himself, right? I remember John 13, Jesus has gathered the disciples up into the upper room and he's speaking with them and instructing them. And there in John 13, you see Jesus washing the feet of the disciples, right? He becomes a servant to them, gets on the ground and does the dirty job and and blesses them in that way. And he goes on to say, I've given you example. Now you go and do likewise. Do the same thing to one another as I have done to you. Serve each other, stoop down, get under, take the lowest seat. And Jesus says right after that, right before he, he goes into the Lord's table, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you should love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So if we here at Makakilo Baptist are, are seeking to have our relationships be as biblical as possible, to, to glorify God as much as possible, then we should do the same thing as Scripture and put massive importance on our character, on our love for one another. Well, this passage here in Colossians gives us probably one of the most complete pictures when it comes to the requisite thoughts, the requisite attitudes we should have when it comes to one another. And it gives us a couple basic ideas. Perhaps you want to write these down. Number one, put on love. Put on love. The basic instruction of the first half of this passage is to put on pub, love. You notice that Paul tells them all these different characteristics they should put on, and then he says in the summary in verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I don't think Paul is delineating that love is different than compassion and kindness and all those things. He even says this, is, this brings everything together in harmony. L- love is the summary thought. Love is the, the final attitude, genuine love for one another. In other words, Paul's saying there in 14, to sum it all up, to bring it all together in harmony, put on love. Clothe yourself in love. Adorn yourself in love. One commentator said this, it's putting on a lifestyle. It's putting on even a personality, a a desire to treat people in a certain way, a, a way that's consistent with love. All right, let's break this down. How does he, before he summarized it as putting on love, what does he say? The well, first thing he says right off of his pen, the first thing he gives us is love's motivation. Did you see that? Put on then as God's chosen ones. He brings up the idea that we have been chosen. The word is eklektos, God's elect. We don't have to get bogged down here, but it's pretty obvious why Paul would bring this up. God loved and elected us completely and totally unconditionally. It's the purest kind of love is unconditional love. God's love for us is completely and totally unconditional. God didn't look down and pick the good ones. Aren't you glad he didn't do that? God didn't look down, and some people say it like this, well, God looked forward in time and looked at those who would choose him and then chose them because they chose him. That's exactly the opposite of what the Bible says. We chose him, we loved him because he first loved us. You did not choose me, I chose you. It's completely unconditional. God did not pick the good ones. God did not pick the ones who first chose him. God loved us in spite of our sin, not because of our goodness. God chose us, and and Paul is reminding them of this absolutely unconditional love. God didn't look down and choose the good ones. He didn't look down and choose the religious ones, the the spiritually minded ones, the ones whom he saw that may choose him later in the future. 
This idea is totally foreign to Scripture. It's an unbiblical way to think. It diminishes the love of God. It turns the love of God to the love of man. We love people because of what they do for us. No, God's love is completely opposite. It is completely unconditional. Romans 9, 11, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. God chooses us. God elects us completely unconditional. His love for us is abjectly unconditional. It's a starting place in terms of motivating ourselves to love one another. And he does this so that his magnificent love would be on display. Why did God set it up this way? I mean, I know that we're big on our own freedoms and our own choices, and we're really important to us that we somehow be autonomous from God and make our own decisions. But why does God set this up? That, that we still have volition, we choose God, but, but God first chooses us. Why did God set it up that way? To show his glory. To demonstrate this love. How else would God demonstrate his love if he just loved the people who loved him? So God set up this system so that he could demonstrate his love. This reminds us of the motivation we studied some months ago at the beginning of Philippians chapter 2. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love. So, So if you've felt unconditionally loved by God, do the same for others. Complete my joy by loving one another. That's what Paul is saying, not only in Philippians, but right here. Put on then, as God's chosen ones. Just just a little reminder there. God held no conditions for his love for you. Why then would you love others conditionally if God loves you unconditionally? If God chose you unconditionally? So that's love's motivation. Then he gets to love's demonstration, and that's where we get to all these different descriptions, these these words that should describe us, these characteristics that should describe us if we put on love. So love's motivation, and now love's demonstration. The first demonstration of God's love, of the love that we should have for one another is compassion. That's the first thing that Paul says, compassionate hearts. Put on compassionate hearts. The word there, compassion, means you should have a level of mercy. You should have an obvious blatant sympathy for one another. This attitude is to reject harshness. It's to reject insensitivity, thoughtlessness. It's to think about others. It's to focus on others, to to take up their cause, to, to remember what it is to be them. Instead of living out your own world in seclusion from others, it's to to be around them, to be with them, to understand them, to to take up their cause, to understand their struggles, their difficulties. Have compassionate hearts. That's sympathy, quite quite literally, that's what it is, sympathy. Kindness is the next word. Kindness is really a demonstration of sympathy, of compassion, very closely related terms. You could say that that first term, compassionate hearts, that's what happens on the inside, and kindness is the expression of that. That word kindness is actually rooted in the word grace. You, you demonstrate grace. Grace is really nothing until it's demonstrated. Right? You don't, we don't sing about God's grace just because we know He has grace, but we've never seen it. We never know that He has grace. No, we know He has grace because He sent His Son, and He graciously saved us. Put on compassionate hearts, put on kindness, put on humility, There are two sides of pride and two sides of humility that correlate with one another, right? Pride is thinking higher of yourself than you ought to and thinking less of others. Humility is the exact opposite, right? It is not thinking as highly of yourself as you ought to, as the Bible says, and it is thinking more of others. It is valuing others as more significant than yourself. You you don't take yourself so seriously, so authoritative, as though you've got it all figured out. You don't listen to that inner voice that says, well, you know, you know more than such and such. You understand that you may be mistaken. You don't see yourself, you don't value yourself more highly than you ought. And at the same time, you value others, their opinions, their ideas, their experience, 
See, pride poisons any relationship. Relationships are, are built on the idea of valuing one another, of treasuring one another, of loving one another. And if, if you're constantly the kind of person who, who puts yourself above others, who, who always has a better idea, who never really conscientiously sets yourself down and lifts others up, then you can't have a relationship with them. There's, there's nothing but pride and a broken relationship. Again, the question is, is this the way you act? Do you, do you put on humility towards others? Do you put on this attitude? The next word, fourth, is meekness. Meekness does not mean weakness. Milk, be a milk toast person, be a doormat. That's not what it's saying. What is meekness? Well, much like the fact that kindness is the expression of compassion and sympathy, meekness is a demonstration of humility. According to Charles Spurgeon, meekness is the readiness to admit your faults, failures, and limitations. It is a resistance to arguing and quarreling with people. A meek person does not get insulted. What, what is insult? What is getting insulted? When, when you feel insulted, basically what you're feeling is, I didn't get the respect I deserve, right? Right? I didn't, they didn't treat me like I feel like I deserve to be treated. I'm insulted. That's what insult is. A meek person doesn't feel that way. A meek person is not insulted. And we're all guilty, right? Because we all get insulted. We all feel hurt when someone shows up. Maybe they do have a pride. Maybe they do have some kind of problem. Maybe they're completely wrong. But that doesn't mitigate our lack of meekness. It doesn't somehow, just because someone may be wrong and we're insulted and we're frustrated and we're mad at them, it doesn't mean that if they're all right and uh, that I'm all right and they're all wrong. No, a lot of times someone treating you wrongly, even if it's in sin, someone treating you wrongly brings out the fact that you have a lack of humility demonstrated by a lack of meekness. A meek person doesn't like to fight. A meek person lays down his agenda. A meek person lays down his reputation. A meek person is quick to realize, and I would say even verbalize, their own failures, their own limitations, their own weaknesses. What this attitude does, John Piper says, is it demonstrates a person's trust in the Lord. I'm not worried about my reputation. I'm not worried about you thinking positive of me and you respecting me and getting what I want. I just trust the Lord. I just believe in God. Whatever comes my way, and people treat me certain ways, bad or good, I trust the Lord. I have a calm temperament. I'm not insulted. I'm not angry. I'm not quarreling. I'm not fighting. I'm not insulted. I don't get that, that way towards people. That's someone who is meek. Calm temperament of meekness should define us all. Sometimes it's not so much about being offended as it is an effort to to constantly put yourself up and to to build yourself up and to remind people of what you know or what you've been or what your rank is or where you are and just constantly put that in front of people. A meek person doesn't do something like that. A meek person has on the tip of his tongue a ready willingness to prefer others, to admit his own weaknesses, his limitations, his faults, to display your trust of God, his will, his position of you All right, characteristic of love number five, patience. Patience, pretty easy. When a person loses his patience, they're basically announcing, my goals have been blocked. And you are the problem of my goals being blocked. I feel that every time I get on the freeway. (laughs) My goal is to drive in that huge five-mile opening that's in front of all these slow people. (laughs) And they're blocking me, right? Right? They're hearse drivers, 10 miles under with their brights on. And I'm looking ahead, longing to be in that big open freeway. And they're blocking my goals. I get impatient with others. Now, that's a simple illustration, but it does bring up the fact that sometimes I'm impatient. And sometimes we're impatient not about silly things like driving on the road, but with each other in church with each other and in terms of sanctification and development. Sometimes we get impatient with people. It's interesting, when you get impatient with someone for not being 
mature or sanctified like you think they ought to, it doesn't reveal their lack of sanctification. It reveals your lack of sanctification because you're impatient. Be patient. It's a demonstration of love. Very similar to meekness. There's a trust in God. There's a, there's a patient confidence in God. Now, related to patience are the final two characteristics. Look at verse 13. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So there's two things there, forbearance and forgiveness. Let me press into this a little bit. Imagine a spectrum. On the, on the one end of the spectrum, you have people's preferences, you have opinions, your opinions, people's opinions, and there's no sin involved. It's just personality differences. It's just preference difference, opinion difference. They, you may have some logic. You may have some opinion based on what you think is a, a good expression of what the Bible says. There may be some, some reasoning there. But in the end, this is, this is not a biblical conviction to go back some Months ago, we talked about the difference between biblical convictions and personal convictions. Biblical being those things that are really clear in Scripture, articulated very clearly, and personal being more the application of Scripture in your life. And this is talking about this, when it comes to forbearance, it comes to the, it's the issue of, of, of thinking through preferences and opinions. I'm sure some people are of the, the strong opinion. I know some people are the strong opinion. We ought to have one service every week. I also know there are many people who are of the strong opinion we ought to keep it the way we've done it for 730 years, two services. It gives people options. Now, we can all admit this is an issue of opinion. There may be some biblical ideas about being together, or maybe there's some biblical ideas about maybe giving options and making sure that everyone can worship. You could probably come up with some ideas from whatever perspective you come from. But we could all admit, as we open the Bible, there's not a verse that says, thou shalt start thy service, thy single service, at 9 a.m. There's nothing in Scripture that says, thou shalt have two services. You can all admit this is not a, a personal conviction, not a biblical conviction. That's what Forbearance. So that's the, the first trait, forbearance. That's one end of the spectrum. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. As you, as you see someone else's opinion or perspective or, or, or personal conviction, as you look at that, you bear with that. You endure with that. You give them the benefit of the doubt. You don't assume the worst about them. Well, they want two services because blah, 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 blah. They want one service because, you know, that is, that's not the attitude of love. Love bears all things. You show forbearance. It is, it is your joy. It is your blessing to yield to people those things. In fact, the word forbearance there, it's the word allowance. You know, an allowance is something, those of us who have kids, remember this, you know, you got allowance for your kids. You budget for. You have a, have a space in your budget. There's room that you make so that you can do this that you can give this away. And that's the idea, right? You, you make room in your heart. You make room, you make an allowance for people's different preferences and opinions, knowing that yours may be no better than theirs. You give room for that. You, you forbear with one another. You bear up their differences, their personality, their desires, their preferences. You bear up. And in fact, it is your your, you feel like it, it's something that it gives you happiness and grace. It's your joy to show forbearance. It's your joy to give these things to others. That's the characteristic of forbearance. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, and it's sort of the same tone, right? If you're looking at a color chart, it's the same tone, but it's on the other end of the spectrum. And it is the word forgiveness. Forgiveness comes into play when sin is involved. When there is sin, the idea is there should be forgiveness. Bearing with one another, that's the one side of the spectrum. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. This is the other side of the spectrum, and I believe what Paul is talking about is that full sense, a full-orbed sense of forgiveness. There should be reconciliation, there should be repentance and confession, and there should be a rejoining, a unity, a harmony, a reconciling forgiveness. The reason I can say that is because it says very clearly there, as the Lord has forgiven us, 
The objective when there's sin involved is confession, repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation, restitution. This is all part of that full sense of forgiveness. And of course, he points to the forgiveness that God has provided us. The forgiveness that God in Christ has provided us is that full sense of reconciliation. It includes confession and repentance, restoration. God restores you to where you should be. That's the forgiveness. So when there's sin, and particularly he mentions a complaint against a brother, and I take that to mean a sin. It's very similar to the wording of Jesus in Matthew 18. When there's a legitimate complaint, when there's clear, obvious sin, there should be this full-orbed sense of forgiveness. Forgiveness. You don't forbear with sin. You don't just know that there's sin in the camp, in the church, and you just say, well, you know, not that big of a deal. Don't really care about that. I'm not going to say anything. There's a sin that's particularly against you, and you're not going to complain about it. You're not going to go up to that person and in love explain to them that, listen, I've been hurt by you. I need to talk to you about this. The objective of that moment when there is sin is this little sermon, gospel sermon, right? You're supposed to re-picture the sermon, to re-present the idea of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Vital to church that we work out these things with one another. It's one of the first things that Jesus mentioned. I mentioned Matthew 18 when Jesus began to describe the church. One of the very first things he's mentioned is this type of process of forgiveness. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. So this is one of the very first things that Jesus talks about when he describes the church. Jesus goes on to to give the example of the unforgiving servant, basically saying, if you cannot forgive others, it's not clear anymore whether you've ever understood the forgiveness of God in the first place. God hasn't forgiven you. You don't know the forgiveness of God. You don't forgive others. So, on one of the spectrum, there are things that are are very uh, clear sins that you deal with, and your objective is forgiveness. There are things on the other end of the spectrum that are preferences and opinions, and you think in terms of forbearance. Now, I understand these things can be complicated, right? Sometimes the main issue is an opinion, but there's sin involved, right? And maybe there's a sin wrapped in another sin, wrapped in opinion, But God wants us to discern, right? These things are not easy, but God wants to discern. Be forbearing where forbearance is important. Be forgiving where forgiveness is needed. And and you discern and you, you, I know there's all these nuances and relationships and you have all these things and and you have to discern where should I be forbearing, where should I be forgiving and, and seek this reconciliation. And you work through those things and you offer these things to your fellow church people. You forbear, you show them forbearance, you show them forgiveness. It's not always easy to discern everything. You do your best to show these things to one another by God's grace. We seek one or the other of these things. There's no middle road, really, when it comes to forbearance and forgiveness. There's no third way of they've sinned, there's obvious blatant sin, but I'm not going to do anything about it. There, it's just an opinion, but I'm going to make a big deal about it. There, there's no third issue. If it's forbearance, you forbear. If it's opinions and preferences, you show forbearance. If it's sin, you seek forgiveness and reconciliation. Not always that easy, but something we should pursue. All right, let's take a glance at the rest of the section. The, the first half of this passage talks about putting on love. The second half... I summarize by saying this, number two, focus on Christ. Draw your attention to Jesus Christ. What better example of love love than Jesus Christ? What better example? Look at the last part, beginning in verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we have the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and the name of Christ. I don't know if each, you notice each one of those things, it ends in this idea of gratitude, of thankfulness. Verse 15, and be thankful. Verse 16, with thankfulness in your hearts. Verse 17, giving thanks to God. So the, the general attitude, as you try to, to dawn on the attitude of Christ, you are thankful for what Christ has done for you. So let's look at these three things, the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and the name of Christ. First of all, the peace of Christ should direct you. Verse 15, the peace of Christ should rule your heart. Let the peace of Christ rule your heart. What is the peace of Christ? Well, it begins with the forensic truth, right? The judicial truth that you are declared righteous. You have been justified because of Christ. Because of Christ in the the courtroom of God, we no longer stand condemned. We are now at peace with God. This is a a, a legal, literal peace that now we are no longer enemies of God. We at once were enmity with God. Now we are friends of God. Peace has been made because of Jesus Christ. And that peace, that official, legal, judicial, eternal, forensic, spiritual peace also provides us, and we've talked about this before, emotional peace, doesn't it? Gives you a peace of mind. Gives you a joy and a, a, a joyous surrender and calmness about your eternity. You felt, felt that peace, hopefully you felt that peace, a few Saturdays, Saturdays ago when the false alarm went out. Hopefully, I know there was probably some panic, but hopefully those of us who are believers got that sense if it's my time to go. What better way to go than instantly? Although that's not always the truth, right? You can linger on with cancer and stuff. But even at that, you would have peace. Lord, you have made peace legally, judiciously, forensically. You've created that peace because of Christ. And I now have this peaceful attitude, this peaceful demeanor. And I think that's what Paul is pointing out to the Colossians here, is that that kind of peace, that kind of emotion, that kind of attitude, that kind of spirit should rule you. It should be the thing that defines you. And I want to tell you this, if you are not a believer, if you have not surrendered your all to Jesus Christ who gave his life for you, who provides you the payment for sin and the righteousness you need to get to heaven, if you've not surrendered your life to him, you don't have that peace. You have restless nights you got that text, that alert, and you worried about your soul. Maybe you didn't do anything then. You don't have that peace. But if you have that peace, if you know that peace, Paul is saying, let that peace rule you. Let that attitude, that spirit, that emotion, let that kind of calm peace rule you. And be grateful to God. There's a thankfulness to it all, that, that you're grateful to the peace that God has provided for you in Jesus Christ. Focus on the peace of Christ which gives you this forensic peace of Christ, which gives you, of course, emotional peace. Second, the word of Christ should dwell in you. Now, some of you type A folks notice that there's a word richly there. And for your sake, you type A people, I wanted my outline to all sort of sound similar, but there is that word, richly, that definition, that idea of how the word of Christ should dwell in you. How should it dwell in you? It should dwell in you richly. What does this mean? I don't think there's some kind of weird thing. I just think it means the word of Christ, the gospel truth, all that Christ has commanded, the word of God should dwell in you in an emotional, passionate way. You should bury it in your heart. You should know it. You should understand it. You should memorize it. But it's not just this cold, calculated getting some words and some knowledge and some theology in your brain. There's, there's much to it. There's, there's a strong emotional aspect. That word richly means in abundance, with richness. The reason we know this is the very next word is singing. 
There's a richness, there's an abundance of knowledge, not heartless, but the kind of truths that make you sing, the kind of truths that make you worship. And note of this, the secondary purpose of singing and worshiping in spirit and in truth is to teach one another. That's what he says here. We sing for God, but we sing to also edify the church, to help one another, and the peace of God should direct you, the word of Christ dwelling in you, and you're singing these songs out of joy, out of praise, and you're helping each other and reminding each other. And I mean, seriously, just, just, let's just talk turkey here, okay? One of the main reasons why we wanted to even try having everyone together isn't that little bit of a cappella we heard at the end, isn't that great? Isn't that good? It's good for my soul to hear everyone singing. I can't live without listening to you guys sing and praise God and repeat back to him all the great things he's done for you. It's a wonderful part of the Christian life. This is the way the word of Christ dwelling in you, expresses itself. Finally, the name of Christ should define you. Verse 17, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, we don't have to be coy here. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to know that he's not saying, in the name of Christ, I put on my socks. In the name of Christ, I walk into the next room. In the name of Christ, he's not saying that, right? What he's saying is, really, the point I'm making, your focus should always be on Christ. There ought to be always this lingering sense that Christ is in me, Christ is with me, and I in Christ, I'm a part of who he is. What Paul is saying is that the person, the words, the commands, the actions, the gospel, the truths of Christ should affect everything that we do. And since in context, this is all about how we work with one another in a church, how we treat one another, this is key. That we remember Christ. That we remember Jesus. Remember His words. Remember His attitude. Remember Him washing the feet of the disciples. We remember these things as we work with one another and treat one another I always ask this question, is this consistent with the name of Christ? This is almost identical to what we studied in Philippians, walk worthy of the gospel of Christ. You're constantly focused on Christ. You're constantly focused on what he's done for you. If my calling and gifting and my fellow church members is because of Christ, then my attitudes and actions are to be consistent with Christ. In other words, it is being a Christian. Someone whose life is defined by Christ. A lot of people call themselves Christians and they don't think a thought of Christ a couple times a year maybe. That ought to be something that dominates us. Well, let me wrap things up by taking us all the way back to that night. I started the message by reminding you of some of the things that Jesus said and when he washed the apostles' feet there. Let me take you back to that upper room. Jesus was with those disciples in that room. Judas had been revealed as the betrayer. He ran off to complete his nefarious task. They had gathered there, and they had gathered there to celebrate the Passover. What is the Passover? Most of you know it. It's the Old Testament or Old Covenant ritual that reminded the people of Israel of God's saving work for them. The Passover was a reminder, and it's very interesting. If you look at the, the different plagues of Egypt that, that God sent to Egypt, and some of them just didn't seem to involve the Israelites at all, and God was just sending this message to Egypt to let his people go. But then you got to, to this one, the, the death of the firstborn, and everybody, including the Israelites, were culpable. So the message of the Passover taught the people, it, it should have anyway, buried in their hearts and minds, that the wages of sin is death that they needed the blood of the lamb to atone for their sins, to cover them, to cover their household, to cover their people. This, this is the message of Passover. And Jesus gathered his disciples and they were to celebrate Passover and it would be the last Passover because 
All those Passovers, all those Pascal lambs that were sacrificed over and over, that they ate and drank and they partook of that Passover lamb over and over and over again, all those things, even though it was what God wanted, it was something that was insufficient because it pointed to the ultimate lamb of God, right? And so the people, the apostles had gathered with Jesus and Jesus was giving them this message. And at those, that original Passover and all the subsequent Passovers, there was a Pascal lamb, but that lamb was ultimately insufficient. It was a shadow of the ultimate lamb of God. Well, let's join Jesus at that final Passover there in John, I'm sorry, Matthew. He says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink all of it, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, when Jesus says, I'm going to give my blood for many, who's the many? It's us, right? It's believers. He's covering those who come under and are atoned by the blood. Those sacrifices, those foreshadowing lambs, signifying their submission to God, their need for atonement, their understanding of their sin, their, their need of this sacrifice. The people of Israel came under that and joined one another under that. They're all a people for whom the blood of those lambs was to cover them. And Jesus is now saying there are many who will come under the, the blood of the lamb. And I've given myself for this purpose. We signify in coming together in the Lord's table, and Jesus is initiating this switch to communion to the Lord's table to signify a very similar thing that the people of Israel signified all those years, that we together have come and we can only survive, we can only have eternal life, we can only have fellowship, we can only find righteousness under the blood of the Lamb. And together we come and we announce our solidarity, our unity under the blood of the Lamb. We, we take part, we're going to take the Lord's table here in a moment, we take part of this believing our sins are atoned by the Lamb. We take part in this believing that God unifies us with Himself and us with one another because of the blood of the Lamb. And this is the point that I'm getting to, the whole message. The, the blood of Christ unifies us together. And it so unifies us together that when we we fail to show love, when we, when we forget compassion and humility and kindness and, and we don't forbear and we argue and bicker and fight, you know what we're doing? We're defying the blood of the Lamb. We're saying, I don't care about the unity that you caused. I don't care about communion. This is why Paul told the Corinthians that if you live like that and you come in and you take communion in the church, you take the Lord's Supper, you eat and drink judgment to yourself. Why? Because you are defying the whole idea of Christ's sacrifice that unifies us together. So Paul tells the people there in Corinthians, first, let a man examine himself. The people examine themselves. And a lot of different aspects, different angles that we can talk about in terms of the Lord's table. But, but one of them is, are we living in communion with one another? Are you right with others in this congregation? Are your accounts settled, yes, with God, but with other people? Or are there ways in which you're living in defiance? The very blood that unified you. 